Great. So um, I think as we've, uh, Estella has rightly said, we want to delve straight into the topic. I think the topic has gained a lot of popularity of late. You know, we've gotten a lot of civil society organizations coming in, you know, to talk about these things, uh, you know, trying to incorporate this topic in almost all aspects of, you know, livelihood and society. So today I'm privileged to share with us all. In fact, we are sharing ideas. I don't know it all, and I may not be an expert in this field, but that is why, you know, this TAWEP has given us the opportunity to converge great minds so that we can at least share ideas. I'll share with you what I know. You also share with me what, what, what you know. And at the end of the day, we'll be making progress wherever we find ourselves, whether you are at the workplace, whether you are in your home, whether you know you are managing your own business or entity or even church or any religious group. So basically, that is it. So today, we're going to look at embracing equity, inclusion, and diversity at the workplace. I'm sure you may have heard it. I mean, Almost every week, there's something about it, or probably every month, there's something on the media about equity, inclusion, and diversity at the workplace. So we, we move on. And our session objectives, you know, will be first to try and understand the basics. You know, let's go to the foundation level to try and really get the, or a grasp of what the topic really is, you know, and how we can relate it to ourselves. Secondly, we will delve into the cracks of the of the topic itself, how we can embrace it or how we can even develop it in the event that the equity, inclusion and diversity is not there. Some people shorten it for EID, some people shorten it for ED and I, whichever way it is, there's an equity, there's an inclusion and there's a diversity. Okay, then we'll look at the importance of it. Is it really something that is important or we think it's just a time waster? It's just a waste of everybody's time. Is it something that has some immense values for us that we think that it can help to perpetuate our generations? You know, so that's what we are going to look at. And then we'll look at the barriers. So far as it's an issue, it's a human institution. We may have some barriers, or we may have some challenges. Some of them may be within our control. Some of them too may be outside our scope of control. And then we we'll look at some statistics, you know, what are what is the data saying as far as diversity, equity, and inclusion is concerned, basically. And then we move on to our QA. So let's move on quickly and then understand what equity, inclusion, and diversity is all about. So we are saying that, and, and for the purpose of this discussion, we are limiting it to the workplace, okay? We are limiting it to the workplace. I mean, this is a topic that you know, encompasses all aspects of life, all aspects of life. So we want to limit or narrow ourselves to workplace because we are, we are looking at the, the, where the get ready for work series, okay? So the diversity, equity, and inclusion are very important concepts that promote one, a fair and what inclusive environment for employees, regardless of their background, identity, or characteristics. So at the end of the day, we are trying to say that, how can we build a framework? How can we build a structure? How can we build a workplace? How can we build an organization, a work organization, where everybody feels welcome, where everybody, everybody feels that he or she is a part of it, irrespective of one, your background, your background simply meaning where you come from, the places you've been, or the persons you've affiliated yourselves to, the kind of ethnic groups and stuff like that that you join. Okay, so basically that's what we are talking about. And as I said, we are limiting our discussion to the workplace. So let's look at what diversity is, which comes from you know the word diverse. Diverse means various, okay? So diversity refers to the presence of a wide range of individual differences, individual differences. And you and I would agree that no two persons are the same. Even twins, identical twins are different. Okay, they may have similarities, but they have a lot of differences that you may want to talk about. So, okay, so when we talk about diversity, you're talking about what differences, individual differences among the employees in an organization. So speaking in my, in my, in my space as an HR person, I have a workforce of over 484, you know, and these people have various backgrounds. We have some who, you know, in, ter in terms of their ethnicity, some are Gans, some are Akans, some are Northerners from the North, some, you know, some we even have expatriates, you understand, diversity. Okay, so we are talking about having people from all, as we always say, people from all walks of life. Okay, so we are looking at one, their race, two, their ethnicity, their gender. And with gender, you know, now 
certain new things are coming up and even in the in the in ghana we have the lgbtq which is going on so sometimes these days when you are even filling forms you know we have the situation where previously we had male and female but now they will have male female and then they will have prefer not to see or they will write others all these are things you know that are coming up your sexual orientation i talk about it lgbtqia plus plus you know we have age we have disability you know your religion you know you may you may not have all your workers as muslims or you may not have all your workers as christians or hindus you may have a varied background of religious you know affiliations our socioeconomic status and then even more okay so you are looking at people's status in life you know some of your employees may be very rich some too may be you know within the middle some too may be really poor like when we talk about poor poorest of the poor so how do you bring all these people with individual differences behind? Okay, we have some people who are introverts. We have some people who are extroverts. We have some people who are the outgoing type. We have some people who are not too, you know, outgoing. So how do we bring all these people together? Now we say that embracing diversity means recognizing. So when you realize that they are there, and then what? You place a premium. That means you are valuing these differences, fostering a workforce, that reflects the rich tapestry of society. Okay, so you agree that in the society we have various classes. So diversity simply looks at bringing all these or recognizing that everybody or the individuals in the workplace are different and placing a certain premium or value on them. Good. All right, so let's look at um, equity. Now, equity focuses on ensuring fairness. You know, so equity is about being fair. Sometimes we keep on hearing, oh, life is not fair. Life has not dealt with me well and stuff like that. So equity talks about being fair, you know, being impartial, you know, being consistent. That the rule that you apply to A, you apply the same rule to B. That you don't say that, oh, this lady is fair, so I like her. Or we, for those in HR, we say that, oh, this person is beautiful. This person is handsome or he has six packs. So I'm going to what, recruit him or her. That's what we are talking about. So impartiality, we want the treatment to access and opportunities for all employees. If you have fuel allowance and it's, it's for all staff, make sure that all staffs are getting it. You don't say that it's only the senior managers who are getting it. No, make sure that it applies to everybody, fuel or transport. Those are the things that we are talking about. Again, we are saying that it acknowledges that individuals may require different resources and support based on their one unique characteristics. Very, very important. Okay. And it's very, very important for us in HR, for us to know that our staffs don't have the same needs. We have different needs and preferences. And that's why as HR persons, you know, those listening in HR, we need to be very unique about, you know, how we craft some of these policies and stuff like that. Now, we are saying that equity means providing everyone with what they need to thrive, taking into account historical advantage or disadvantages and systemic barriers that certain groups may face, okay? So you may have instances where people, you know, are faced, for instance, you may, you may have a staff who may have come from maybe a war-torn war country. Such person may come with all manner of ideologies and a certain kind of orientation. How are you going to integrate the person or how are you going to treat the person such that the person doesn't feel like, oh, me, because of where I'm coming from, because of the place where I'm coming from, I'm not entitled to this. You know, even in Ghana, we, we believe that you know, certain classes of people in the past were confined to certain kinds of work. I mean, I don't want to go straight to mention those things, but we, we had that belief. And that is what really prevailed those times that, oh, this class of people used to do certain or were slaves to so, so, and so. So we allow sometimes these things to simmer into our current administration and we think that, oh, you are from this place, then this job is, is good for you. That's equity, okay? So we are trying to say that we are eliminating all those uh, historical barriers, all those historical, you know, challenges that uh, exist with regards to these classes of people. Good. Now let's talk about inclusion. That means to include. Inclusion is the practice of creating an environment where all employees feel valued. Okay. So again, we are talking about value. We, we want to have, so in, in HR, we have employee engagement or now even employee experience. You know, we want to make sure that all our staff feel valued, whether you are a cleaner, whether you, you are a machine operator, whether you are a procurement person, whether you are a psychologist, whether you are the, whatever it is, you are the driver. You know, we, we need to place, we, we need to let you know that no, 
you are a part of the company. Secondly, respected, and then again, empowered to fully participate. There are some companies, if you have, or there are some organizations, depending on your role, that's when you'll be determined to make a say or not. Irrespective of what sometimes, if you are maybe, excuse me, say you are a cleaner in your organization, you, you, have, you, make, you make a very nice observation about A, B, or C, or something that's going on, and they say, oh, who are you? Excuse me, who is this common cleaner? You know, some organizations are like that, but inclusion forbids us or inclusion does not encourage us to do these things. You are saying that it goes beyond diversity by not embracing differences, but by not only embracing differences, okay? So inclusion goes beyond diversity. Diversity is, you know, trying to realize that people are different, but this one says fostering a sense of belonging, okay? So with this one, we are breaking all barriers. Probably where you live, even in the Bible, you know, the good Samaritan said the Samaritans do mingle with, you know, this class of people. It's right from Bible days, right from historical days. And even in our ethnic groups, we believe that there are certain uh, uh, ethnic groups that, you know, intermarried, you shouldn't marry. So maybe if you're an account, you shouldn't marry maybe a guy or, uh, uh, you know, those things are there. But with inclusion, we are saying that everybody comes together. So that if you are the HR person sitting on the table, or if you are whoever, the manager who is sitting on the, on, the, on, on, the, on the recruiting table or in that office there, you don't say that, oh, this person is not from my hometown, so I'm not going to bring him. Or probably the person is from a different place or the, the person has a different educational setup. So you say that, oh, this person, he hasn't gone to Harvard like the way all of us have gone to Harvard. So your views don't count. You understand me? So inclusion talks about a sense of belonging. We are breaking the barriers. Inclusive workplaces actively see what? Diverse perspectives, diverse, okay? Actively engaging employees and then creating a culture where everyone can bring their authentic selves to work. So inclusion is celebrating the uniqueness of every individual, trying to place that premium on everybody that, no, everybody is unique. Okay, now let's, 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 let's pick something. We have even instances in classroom where those days, you remember when you were in class, if you are not good in mathematics, they say, oh, this girl or this boy is, you know, is blockheaded. They use all manner of terms for you. Oh, this guy is not, you know, very intelligent. You know, and we had all those things. You see, we didn't have inclusion those days. So somebody may not be academically good then, but football, the person may be very good, very, very good footballer. Let me tell you, the truth is that these days, the footballers are the people who are even earning more. Some, some of them are earning like 82,000, you know, 82 million pounds a month and which employee will earn all these? So you realize that these things, if they had probably been, you know, had we had we had started the conversations earlier, we would not have been, you know, sidelined some people. Some people, their own is technical, you know. So inclusion means that welcoming everybody, irrespective of their background, making everybody feel a part that, oh, I don't think that, oh, okay, me, I'm a technical man. So I'm not part of the, the admin people. We are all together and together we make that unique whole. So I have this, you know, diagram, beautiful diagram here that sums up, you know, the basics, that sums up, you know, the definitions, that sums up the, the understandings of diversity, equity, and inclusion. So for diversity, we are saying that it asks the question, who is in the room? Okay, so who is in the room means that anybody at all, whether you are these days, I hear they don't say you are a short person, they say you are vertically challenged. Okay, so you don't say that short man going or that short woman going, please, you don't say that. You say the person is a vertically challenged person. Okay, so diversity asks the question, who is in the room? So who is in that organization, in that company there? Who and who are there? Are you picking people based on a certain class of living? Some people may want to say, oh, no, this guy doesn't have this amount. Or some people even recruit you based on the fact that you have a car or you don't have a car. I learned there was there's a school, a certain school in Ghana here, where if they want to give you admission, admission to your ward, they will ask whether the parents have a car. Well, they may have very genuine reasons why they want to do that. Okay. They ask, does your parents have a car? If your father or mother does not have a car, that means that you are not part. You see, so diversity asks the question, who is in the room? Now, equity asks, who is trying to get into the room or in the room but cannot? Okay, so we are giving equal opportunity to everybody, but you realize that some people don't have access to that. Okay, for instance, when we go to our educational institutions, maybe, you know, the, you know, the tertiary level, they say they have student financial aid office. Is that really accessible to everybody? So who 
may be really in dire need of it. Sometimes they even talk about scholarships, giving scholarships to people who really need it. I think like, some time ago in the realm, not to sound political, there was one political man, you know, you know, politician who said that he gave, you know, opportunity, a very top notch scholarship to the daughter or the son and the person went. And then they were asked, ah, but you, you are, you, this is the work you do. You have access to all the, you know, all the government resources. He said, please, at that time, I did not have money. <laughs> you know, so we are talking about giving equal access to all in the room. Okay, so who is trying to get into the room but cannot get there because of certain barriers, because of certain challenges? Then inclusion asks the question: Have everyone's ideas been heard? Are we trying to celebrate the innovation and creativity and uniqueness? of everybody. Are we trying to celebrate the outstandingness of everybody taking into consideration? So you see, inclusion actually places premium on people's capacity, letting people know that they, they, they can become the best versions of themselves, letting people know that indeed they are not good for nothing. You know, let me go back to the classroom again, because you remember those days, you know, they used to tell you all manner of things. Sometimes they tell you, you are very, you are very stupid. You know, or even sometimes even in the home, your mom, because you have, you know, we have some children are very stubborn and say, you, you are good for nothing. Nothing good can come out of you. And you see all these things simmer into their head. So sometimes it doesn't foster that kind of inclusion. And let me tell you, there are some people who have very low self-esteem such that when they go into organizations, they feel like, oh, as for me, I'm not part of it. I can cite instances in certain places I've worked where sometimes when we are doing, let's say maybe Friday birthday parties and stuff like that, some sections we call all staff to come. Then staff says, oh, this one is not for you, it's for the managers. Then we say, no, HR council say, no, this is for everybody. So, ah, we think that this one is just for, you know, those people who are driving the big cars and wearing the suits. Sometimes even suits alone can, spare, can, can cause a stare in organizations, you understand me? So in a, in a nutshell, we are saying that diversity asks the question, who is in the room? Equity asks the question, who is trying to get it? That's fairness, okay, but cannot. And then inclusion as has everyone's ideas or have everyone's ideas been heard? Okay, good, let's move on. So the key question again is, how can we develop equity, inclusion, and diversity in the workplace? How can we develop it? How can we build it? How can we foster it? How can we create that framework? How can we create that enabling environment where in that organization there, irrespective whether it's a multinational company or whether it's a Ghanaian company or whether it's, 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 a, it's a hybrid, whatever it is, how can we create that environment where everybody feels a part of it, where we celebrate each other's uniqueness? Good. So we are saying that building diversity, equity, and inclusion at the workplace requires a multifaceted approach. This simply means that it requires you to put into, into effect all the energies, all the resources, all the connections, all the links that you may need to what, have. So multifaceted, that means that it's not just one-sided. It has a lot. And it's again because human beings are complex in nature. And human beings have different characteristics. That means that you would have to engage multifaceted. You take this approach, it doesn't work. You take another approach, it doesn't work in a way, in one way or the other, until you find a, 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 a very, you know, a common premise where you can build all this, you know, equity, inclusion, and diversity at the workplace. And we are saying that all these things that we are doing, it requires one, commitment. Commitment is key in all spheres of life, whether the person is, is married or whether the person is single, whether the person is working or whether the person is a student or whether the person is a footballer, you know, everything. Commitment is one of the key requirements to make any institution work. And it also requires a strategy, a plan. It has often been said that failing to plan is what? Planning to fail. So if you really want to build this equity, inclusion, and diversity, you need to plan for it. it as in, you need to be intentional about it. And then again, we say that it is an ongoing effort. It is not something that you do and say, oh, this one, I mean, we are okay. I mean, we are finished. It's something that you keep on doing over and over again. Why? Because new things are coming up each and every day. New policies are coming up. New individuals are coming up. Now we have, we have the millennials who are coming up. We have people, you know, who are the, uh, 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 the, the, the fourth industrial revolution. We have the artificial intelligence. All these things, you know, are coming up. So we need to recognize that diversity, diversity equity, and inclusion is an ongoing effort as far as society is not static by dynamic. We need to have that at the back of our minds. 
Good. So the first thing we want to talk about as one of the effective tools of building equity is what? Leadership commitment. It always starts from the top. We have, uh, uh, we have uh, an old adage in a local parlance, which, you know, you know, if I want to translate, say that if fish is spoiling, it starts from the head. Say so numbers, say I need affinity. Okay. So if fish is spoiling, then it must start from the head. So if that same fish will also not spoil, but have a very good, you know, health, then it must start from the head. So we are saying that leadership must be committed to this cause. Senior leaders must demonstrate a strong commitment to diversity and communicate its importance throughout the organization. It's very, very important. We need to explain it. We need to place importance of it on it because if we don't do that, there's no way that those in the other levels of the organization will be able to you know, attach importance. And we are saying that it should be reflected in what our mission statement, it should be reflected in our core values and our strategic goals. Okay, so you go to some organizations and they talk about, you know, innovation, they talk about all inclusiveness, they talk about teamwork, you know, they talk about, you know, um, building bonds, you know, they talk about friendship and friendliness. All these are, you know, values that, in, that are inculcated to the employees for them to know that, oh, so management thinks about me. Oh, so board thinks about me. Oh, then I, 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 I'm very happy that I'm a part of the organization. We are talking about what? Assessing and measure. That's the second thing we want to talk about. Data is very important. So you will need to conduct a thorough assessment of the organization's current state. So don't just sit down and say, maybe after this, that, oh, okay, I realize that, you know, diversity is good, or inclusion is good, or equity, and, uh, and all these things are good. Let me go and start it. Where is the starting point? You must always have data. So we are saying that collect data on your demographics. And this is where HR analytics come in. So for those in HR, you realize that HR analytics has become a new norm, you know, where you're able to get data of your staff, get their demographics, you know, get their employee experiences, their perceptions through staff service and all of that, focus groups and interviews. It is only through these that you'll be able to know that, oh, okay, so my staffs feel that they are not a part. Let me give you a typical example. When you go to manufacturing sector, we have instances where Sometimes there's all, there always seems to be like a rift between those in the, in, the, in the factory and then those in the head office. Because you see those in the head office, like the sales, the marketing and the rest, they are always in tie, suit and tie going to you know, the, the, the field. Those in the, in the factory are also always wearing their working gear, standing behind the machine. You, sometimes when you even go to the factory, it's hard to even recognize them you know, because they are so drenched in whatever they are doing with their working gear and all. So sometimes there seems to be that you know, rift there. So when you're able to collect data, when you're able to do survey, and you're able to get that all the relevant demographics and everything. And you realize, oh, okay. So I was thinking, maybe, or you will be thinking that, oh, okay. You think that everybody in the organization feels loved, but some people don't feel that. Some people may think that, no, okay, management only thinks about itself. Management has always been buying cars, you know, and thinking about only those in the head office. How about those of us in the regions? How about those of us, you know, who are far away in the branches? You understand me. So you need to assess, you need to measure collect data, HR analytics can be a very good help to you. And then we are talking about what? You need to eliminate bias in hiring and promotion. And this one, I'm going to be very, you know, go very hard on our HRs. You know, sometimes in our organizations and, and the kind of culture that we have built as Ghanaians, you know, we need to know somebody who knows another person who knows another person. Okay, so sometimes in, in, when we are doing our recruitment, say, so, oh, please, this is my, my uncle's nephew. This is my wife, daughter's brother's son. You know, we have all these things. Oh, please, this one, do something. The person has stayed in the house for seven years. This person has been in the house for the past 15 years. Organizations don't call him. You are our last hope. You know, so they'll come and appeal to all your conscience. So if you are not careful, you realize that, oh, Charlie, let me sort this my person out. Oh, let me sort this my big man out. Let me sort this my big woman out. Meanwhile, there may be other people who are equally qualified or even more qualified but than this person. But because of what we are talking about, this bias, you say that, oh, okay, let me just, you know. So these are some of the things we are talking about. Okay, so you need to eliminate all those things. Give the, give the, the chance to the person who really deserves it. I know that you may be saying that this one there is difficult. Assuming you yourself, you are the head of HR or you are the HR officer and your brother, little brother has stayed in the house for the past five years and there's a role in the marketing department, okay? 
Sometimes you may want to try and, and, and these things are part of society. These things are part of culture, you know, but as, as much as possible, we need to be able to try and be objective so that we can, what, eliminate some of these things. So we are saying that it includes what? Uh, involve blind resume uh, reviews. Oh, okay, oh, this one, let me pass the person. Structured interviews and, you know, diverse interview panels and establishing clear, you know, uh, evaluation criteria. So if you want to, you know, uh, uh, resolve this thing. Sometimes for me personally, what I do is that if I have somebody coming for an interview and I know that person or the person is linked to me, I can ask and say that, please, this interview, I know this person. I don't want to be part of it because I don't want my decisions or my knowledge of the person to affect the outcome of the interview. So I say, please, with all due respect, I know this person. I recommended him. I don't want to be part of the interview. And so we can also use that one so that we don't bring in that kind of thing. And then the next thing, you know, we've talked about strategy is what? Having a plan, developing a strategy. Don't just start up and say, oh, uh, what can we do? Let's bring, let's start doing parties. The party you want to do, there must be a plan to it. The happy hour you want to do, there must be a plan to it. The, the you know, the, the forum that you want to do, there must be a plan to it. How are you do going about it? So we are saying you need to create a comprehensive strategy. And that strategy must take into consideration all the various, you know, persons within the organization, get the various groups within the organization, okay? We used to have, and if the organization is a unionized, you know, environment, you need to seek the, the consent. You need to seek the buy-ins of the union. I remember I used to work in a certain company where we were, you know, having certain structural change. I remember the union represented heavily. There were some members from the union. There were some members from you know, management, and it was a very wonderful experience because at the end of the day, management took the decision, taking into consideration the views of the unions, okay? So it's very important that we, we address it that the strategy should include specific actions, initiatives, and timelines, okay, to promote diversity, ensure equity, and foster inclusion. It should address areas such as one, recruitment, two, hiring, retention, promotion, training, and what? employee resource group. So it's very important. So some of us, you know, have, you know, in the workplace, we have this employee handbook or HR policies and procedures and all these things have a certain policy around some of these things. So you realize that, oh, okay. So when it comes to promotion, promotion, you should have ended, you know, or you should have worked for a certain number of years. You should have gotten consistency in terms of performance appraisal over a certain number of years, you know, in terms of training, training. We have instances, you know, training, Training sometimes is very lucrative. Let me let me put it in that way because you are going for training and the allowance is, let's say, a short course, maybe outside, you're going to the UK or the US for, let's say, two weeks, you are going to be given per diem. You know, I remember I used to work in a place where, you know, the person was even giving warm clothes allowance, warm clothes, warm clothes allowance because the place was going to be very cold. And when you look at the figures, so sometimes you may, you may tend to think that, oh, okay, uh, we are six in the department, but Adwa is my favorite. Adwa, come. I want to favor you because you are, you know you are my person. You know we gel. You know we have been vibing a lot. As for Yamansa and Obasan, I don't like them. So you realize that these things influence you. Meanwhile, the Adwa you are talking about does not have the need for the training. Maybe it's Obasan who really needs that training. Or it's the Yamansa who really needs that training. But because of, you know, your prejudice and your bias. So we need to have a strategy. We need to have a plan. And that plan must be an all-inclusive plan. Good. What else can we do? We need to enhance diversity in recruitment. I, 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 most of the time, when you look at the, the, the dailies or when you look at you know, job ads in the, in the, on the, uh, online and others, you say that they say that we are an equal uh, opportunity employer. Okay, we are an equal EEO equal employment opportunity. That means that everybody is encouraged to apply. So we are saying that we must expand our recruitment efforts to attract a more diverse pool of applicants, okay? So then again, let me talk about uh, what pertains sometimes even in our, in our industries, okay? Sometimes we have um, certain companies that place only a premium, a premium on only those who are investing, who have gone to university. So if you went to Polytechnic, that means you are not part, you see? But for all you know, the person who went to that polytechnic and, and experience has shown me not to be biased that experience has shown me that sometimes some of the poly trained people are very, very, you know, meticulous they, because of the practical experience and the workshop and other things that they give them. But the company may say, oh, if you are not a university graduate, I will not pick you. And some may even go ahead and say that if you are not from a certain type of university, I'm not going to pick you. So then the question is, 
I that went to Yamansa or, 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 or Kotoku, Kotoku University. That means that even if I'm good, I'm not going to get it. So we need to enhance diversity. We need to open our nets wide, okay? And make sure that we are getting people from the polytechnic, those who have HNDs, those who have other professional courses and stuff like that. We need to review job descriptions, you know, to ensure that they are all inclusive and promote what's a welcoming environment. The next thing we can do is what? Provide diversity and inclusion training. I think training is one of the key things. You know, I remember I used to work in an organization where, you know, we had sponsorship for a certain project and, and it, was, it had to do with this diversity thing, sexual harassment and all of that. And they had to do training. They had to organize people to come and do training for us. Okay, did policies, everybody signed. Okay, so as HRs or as managers in our organization, let's do training. Some people, sometimes you might think that, oh, everybody is, no, but sometimes when you really go deep into these things, maybe some organizations that do employee assistance. I remember we did some pilot, you know, um, employee assistance, counselor, counselor training, and the kind of things that came out because of confidentiality, I may not be able to share it, but even if you're a counselor and you counsel some of your people, the kind of things that come out, the kind of, you know, experiences. I remember in another place I used to work, there was this young lady who actually had been beaten. In fact, she wasn't even, apparently I learned that she was living with the boyfriend and the boyfriend had severely beaten her. But you know, staff were trying to cover it and they didn't tell the HR at that time. But HR got to know that, oh, so this is the case. The, the staff had been beaten by the boyfriend and had thrown her out, you know. And all these things, if we do diversity training, will be able to bring all these persons. In fact, it really affected the lady for over two, three months. You could see that she just wasn't herself, okay? When we do this diversity training, it helps people to come out of their shelves so that they will be able to tell us that, oh, this and this and these are the problems we are going through. And let's see how management can help, you know, try and bring all these things to um, an end. Good. Now, let's look at importance. Is this really important? What are some of the, the benefits that we stand to get? The first one is what enhance innovation and problem solving. You would agree with me that when we get people from various backgrounds, you know, I mean, and when you go to an organization where you have multinationals, you have Indians, you know, Indians and Pakistanis, they are maybe noted for maybe IT. So you can tap from them. Maybe you can get people from maybe South Africa. You can get Ghanaians who may be technically very good. You know, maybe in the area of chefs, you can go to the Francophone countries. Maybe you have all these people in your organization. I remember... I used to work in a certain multinational where we were employing chefs and these chefs were coming from, from the Francophone countries. They were very, very, very good chefs, you know. So it gives you that capacity to be able to get innovation. They bring new ideas on board, okay? And you're able to expand your problem-solving horizon. So it's very, very important. The next thing I want to talk about is what? Increased employee engagement and satisfaction. So we are saying that inclusive environments where employees feel valued, respected, and included tend to have higher levels of engagement and job satisfaction. Okay, so they feel satisfied because they don't have any form of burden. You see, sometimes, I, I want to give you a little test. Sometimes, just watch. Sunday evening, you see people start us, ah, oh, I'm going to that boring place again. Then they say, ah, oh, Mondays are my boring days. Ah, oh, Mondays, and uh, I know, no. Then go uh, on Thursday evening and say, thank God it's Friday, yay, because I'm not coming to work. You understand? But if we have equity, inclusion, and diversity, when people are coming to work, they are so happy. They are so engaged. They are so happy because I'm coming to meet my brother from uh, maybe another ethnic group. I'm going to learn something new from her. I'm going to meet somebody from another you know, country, going to uh, you know, learn all manner of things. And together, we can sharpen ourselves, which says I have uh, iron, really sharpen at iron. The next thing, again, is what? Improved decision-making and performance, of course. He says two good hairs. It's not two hairs, so because if the two hairs are not good, then they cannot be better. <laughs> so it's what two good heads are what better than one. So diversity is benefit from a variety of what perspectives and insights. Okay, so maybe we are talking about labor issues. I have a Ghanaian, I have a Nigerian, I have a South African, I have I have someone from the U.S. We can all together talk about our labor laws. Maybe in terms of women. Like the other day, I was reading about you know the legislation when it comes to women you know, and pregnancy and all of that. There were some places that is able to even give one year paid leave to our women. You know, there are some places that is able to give six, six months. There are some places, even the men, even the men are affected. 
you know, be able to give, let's say, six months or three months to the man to, you know, help the woman. And all these are things that if you have people from various, you know, nationals, and maybe you are crafting a policy on maybe maternity, once you have all these things, you're able to get an enriched, you know, view. Let's assume we are all Ghanaian. All we know is the labor has talks about just three months or, you know, 12, uh, you know, weeks. So all we know is 12 weeks. Sometimes even some organizations will tell you, Madam, your time is due. Please hurry up and come. Sometimes I remember there's, that there's one colleague who complained that even when she had given birth fresh, the boss was calling her, please come to the office and come and open a document for me. How? How can we talk about equity and inclusion and diversity when we have all these things? So it's important that this thing helps us to make what improve decision making. In fact, I will call it decision making and performance at an international standard. Very good. Then we talk about what expanded talent pool and recruitment advantages. Of course, I remember I used to work in one hospitality space where we had our chefs from South Africa, we had some from Zimbabwe, and they helped to spice up our, you know, our menu. And because of that, we were able to attract lots of, you know, customers. You know, some of these expatriates, you know, came there to eat because they could eat what they eat in their countries right in Ghana. So these are the things we are talking about. about okay. So organizations that promote EID create a reputation as what? inclusive and progressive employer. So at the end of the day, we become an employer of choice. You put out an ad and you realize that people from Korea want to apply. People from China want to apply. People from South Africa want to apply. People from uh, uh, Brazil want to apply. These are the things we are talking about. Again, the next thing is what? Enhanced customer understanding and service. Diverse workforces are more representative of the diverse workforce or uh, work, diverse customer base that they serve, okay? So this facilitates better understanding of what customer needs, customer preferences, and cultural nuances. Okay, so for instance, if you operate a restaurant, you know that people from the Middle East don't eat maybe pork and some other things. So you don't just go and serve them pork or even bring the menu and wear their pork on it. You understand? So these are some of the things that we are talking about. Organizations that value UID are more likely to develop products, services, and marketing strategies that resonate with a broader range of customers. It's very, very important. So you look at the demographics and then you're able to carve a certain product for them to be. You realize that sometimes products that sell in Ghana may not sell in, in maybe South Africa because the dynamics are different. Pro, pro, uh, maybe a product that may sell in, 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 in maybe East Africa may not sell in China or maybe in, in South America. So those are the things that we're talking about. Once you have a diverse workforce, they understand what their people need and then they're able to you know, assist you to get your... So what are some of the barriers? that now we are talking about embracing. What are some of the barriers? What are some of the barriers we can talk about? Barriers to diversity, inclusion, and, and, and diversity. So we are talking about unconscious biases. Unconscious bias. Everybody has it. Unconscious biases are what deeply ingrained stereotypes. Stereotypes are certain false beliefs or prejudices that affect our percep per per perceptions and decisions without our awareness. You know, there are inborn, they are ingrained. And again, we can trace these things to probably some experiences we may have had or some encounters that we may have gone through in the past. Let's assume that you have worked for a Ghanaian company and that Ghanaian company didn't treat you well. Or you have worked for, let's say, a local company and that local company or all of it, maybe you're in Togo or you're in Mali and all that time you have worked for that Malian company and they haven't treated you well. And then you get another offer from another Malian company. The first question you ask yourself is, are they going to treat me or ask for Malian companies or ask for Ghanaian companies or ask for South African companies? They don't treat people well. This is just an example, okay? They don't treat people well, okay? So it becomes an inbound. So sometimes you may even see the ad and then you say, mm, this one, I'm not interested. Again, you may have certain instance where, let's say, um, in terms of people from various ethnic groups, Sometimes they say that, oh, as for this organization, we don't, we don't recruit accounts because the CEO is an account, the wife is an account, all the managers are accounts. Sometimes, uh, let me just give you an example. Sometimes just go to, you know, some of the company's websites, you see that they are all of a certain, maybe if they are guns, it's all guns, if they are airways, it's all airways, you know, speaking from a Ghanaian point of view, okay? Some of these things, so if you, you apply and you maybe you are, you are a fancy, you are not an airway. A fancy is always a fancy. So he comes and say, oh, I have this, I have that. I say, oh, we know that, you know, you have all the calls, but unfortunately, we are not going to pick you. They, know they may not come out to tell you, but that may be the reason. Have you ever wondered why sometimes you go for certain interviews and sometimes they come out to tell you that, oh, you are very good and all of that, but you couldn't qualify. They are certain or more. Some of these is because of unconscious biases that they have. 
The second one is what? Lack of representation. Uh, saying that certain groups may be underrepresented. You know, we have our women due to historical advantage, disadvantages and all of that, okay? So certain groups may be underrepresented and mostly it's our women. But these days, you realize that we have a lot of women at top-notch places, you know, because of the girl-child education that was emphasized on some years, some years back, okay? So you can see that gradually in Ghana, we are getting some kind of, you know, change. Again, one barrier is what? Resistance to change. A lot of people are resistant to change, depending on the kind of change that you have. Okay, so it may face some kind of resistance. Who so I say that, oh, as for me, I don't want this thing. You know, people are maybe very, very traditional. So that is also there. And then we may have a lack of resources and expertise. This thing requires training. This one, this thing, this thing, uh, diversity requires time. It requires commitment. So my name is ah, when we are doing our production, when we are going to look for money, you are coming to HR. Stop worrying us with this your diversity thing. We don't have by the HR. Leave my office. You understand? So by the time you realize HR or whichever uh, office that is handling or spearheading this diversity thing has what? Has just, you know, folded the, you know, the, 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 the paper books and then there's one away. So lack of resources is part of it. And then also expertise. Technical people who have the know-how to train people and also to encourage these initiatives in the organization. And then we have sustaining commitment. This thing talks about sustenance. We need to be able to sustain it. It's not something you do today and then end it tomorrow. So let's briefly look at statistics and then I pause and then we look at some questions. I think I have some 15 minutes more. So let me just end quickly so that I can also listen to your side of it. Maybe you may have some insight to share. You ask questions, we all try and brainstorm and see how we'll be able to look at it. So statistics on diversity. You know, we have, we say that racial and ethnic diversity. And it says that representation of racial and ethnic minorities in the workplace vary by what region and industry. We are seeing an example in the United States, for example, the 2020 diversity in the workplace report. So you will see that already they have a certain cost to diversity. So they are doing diversity in the workplace report. It states that reported by the US Bureau of Labor Statistics show that the labor force participation rates of whites, black or African American, Asian, and Hispanic or Latino workers. So these are the statistics. They, uh, we have 61.2%, we have 61.3%, 61.4%, and then 66.65%. Okay, so these are the, you know, the representation. They did a survey and this is what they saw. Now let's come, let's narrow down to Africa and Ghana. It says that in many African countries, women face various barriers to employment and career advancement. Again, according to the African Development Bank's 2020 e Gender Equity Index, Women's labor force participation in sub-Saharan Africa was 57.6% in 2019, compared to what? 80.5% for men. Okay, so you realize that men are always having uh, that happen hand when it comes to, you know, the workplace and all of that. Okay, he said women also tend to be underrepresented in leadership positions. Okay, so gradually, you know, we are seeing a change, but still you have more and more, you know, you have more and more men at the helm of affairs is very, very important. So again, let's come to Ghana's labor force. It says in Ghana, the labor force participation rates vary by gender. Now, according to the Ghana Statistical Service, that's the statistical body in Ghana, it says the labor force participation rate for males in Ghana was what, 74.4% in 2020, while it was what, 50.6% for females. Okay, so clearly you see that the male so that's why sometimes people say that it's a man's world. You know, so men, men are dominating everywhere, okay? But gradually, when we're able to include some of these diversity, equity, and inclusion strategies, it will help to bridge the gap, okay? These figures reflect the gender disparity in workforce participation and can impact representation at different levels of employment. Lastly, on this statistics, it says that workplace inclusion in Ghana, it says that there are ongoing efforts in Ghana to promote workplace inclusion and diversity. So, for example, we have the Labor Act 2003, Access 51, which prohibits what? Workplace discrimination based on gender, race, ethnicity, religion, disability, and more. So, the subsequent ones are going to talk about some of the laws, some of the legislations that really promotes. We know that in Ghana, in our organizations, you know, the, uh, manage, uh, there's, there's some kind of premium that has been placed on diversity, equity, and inclusion. So, we are saying now, what are some of the legislations that border on uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion? Now, let's talk about the Constitution of Ghana. You know, that's the fundamental law of Ghana. That's the supreme law of Ghana. And, and, and every other law of Ghana must have its roots in it. You know, any law, it says that any law that is inconsistent with this one, you know, is re regarded as null and void, any law in Ghana. So we have, uh, you know, uh, Article 35, you know, Clause 5 talks about, you know, justice 
fairness and respect for the rights of people. And this clearly is in support of equity, you know, equity, you know, uh, you know, uh, inclusion and all of that. So after 35 talks about it, and he says that human resource development must be without what discrimination on grounds of gender, religion, tribe, or physical condition. When you have time, you can just get the constitution of Ghana, buy it and read it. Article 35 is there, talks about it. Again, Article 36 6 also talks about the state providing equal of economic opportunity, you see. So who is out there that is supposed to come in? So let's provide equal upon economic opportunity to all, and in particular to fully integrate women. Okay, because we are coming from a background where women were confined to the kitchen, where women were saying those days we when they used to do the girl child they said uh, the man would say he would tell the girl child that means that you the woman yours is the kitchen go to the kitchen go and prepare nice meals fufu and 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 and, and okro uh, or banku and okro fufu and katenkwa and so that all of us we so that when your brother comes back from school you, you also get some to eat you know so article 10 says talks about what that kind of equality economic equality to everybody you know particular emphasis on women again Article 24 one, it says every person has the right to work under satisfactory. Mm? Satisfactory is very important. That means you, you are okay, you are satisfied. Not that you are working in an office where you don't even have a place to sit on. Where you are working in an office where all the tiles are broken to the extent that sometimes it can even cut you. You know, safe and healthy conditions, especially those in the production, those in the manufacturing, those in the extractive industry. That's why we have health and safety conditions where if you are going to the site, you must make sure you have all your protective equipment and all of that. And shall receive equal pay, so equal equity, equal pay for equal work without distinction of any kind. So all these things are in support or all these legislations are in support of diversity, equity, and inclusion. Again, Article 27 talks about what? Special care shall be accorded to mothers. Very important. During a, uh, during a reasonable period before and after childbirth. And during those periods, working mothers shall be accorded paid leave. There are some organizations where you go to tell you that, please, you are not allowed to get pregnant. There are some people when you get, please, when you get pregnant, you may be sad. We've had instances like that. And all these things don't foster, you know, diversity, inclusion, and equity. So it's important that we talk about that. The last I want to talk about has to do with the labor law. So all these laws I talked about in the constitution have been expanded in the Labor Act 2003, Act 651. And that is the manual for most of the, for all HR professionals. And no, I would want to encourage, even if you're not an HR professional, you need to have a copy of the Labor Act because it spells out your rights, it spells out your duties, it spells out what even the employer can do. Some organizations have, you know, sucking people anyhow for no reason. Sometimes they come and then they look at the, the shape of your eyes and they say, ah, your eye is not nice. Let me suck you. And they say, HR, suck this person. And HR has to now have the difficulty of finding a certain, you know, offense to slap on the person so that they can suck the person. All these things don't foster, you know, labor. So I'm going to encourage you, try and get a copy. You can get some at the assembly press. You know, you can get some there. It's there. Get it and then read it. So section eight to nine, it talks about protection of employment. You know, talking about your rights, your, you know, your duties and all of that. Section 20 to 30 talks about the general conditions, you know, in terms of your leave, when you're employed, you get an offer letter. So all this has to do with what the treatment, the economic empowerment we are talking about. Section 45 to 54 talks about what? Persons with disability. In fact, this one is a whole topic on its own, you know, and I want to comment some of the governments in Ghana where they have, you know, employed ministers who were, you know, uh, uh, you know visually impaired, you know, some sitting in maybe wheelchairs and all of that. But with a very high intellectual, you know, capacity, it's very, very, you know, important that the law caters for it. So, section 45 to 50 talks about persons with disability, it supports it. And then we are talking about employment of women. You know, women is very, very important, very, very key because they are very vulnerable in society. So, section 55 to 57 talking about the fact that if a woman goes on maternity, you need to pay the person, you need to provide medical certificates so that you get your maternity leave and all of that. In the event that is CS, I mean, our lawyers will come in you know, and all of that. And then section 77 talks about what protection of remuneration. Others talk about fair and unfair termination. All these things are there. So all these laws put together, we have the labor uh, instrument, uh, the LIs 1822, also talking about, you know, or reinforcing what these things have talked about. Maybe, you know, our lawyers on the platform can help us to, you know, share more insights. And, you know, maybe when it's time for question, you can share some insights. Maybe you were not treated well based on the fact that maybe you were discriminated against and all that. That's all that we are talking about in this you know, session. So basically that is that. So I bring the curtain to a close here. Uh, that's the little I have to share. Let me hear from you. Let me hear you share some examples, practical examples of that. 
some questions, anything you want to share, let's just come on board. So Esther, over to you. Okay, thank you so much, Mr. Sam. This has been very, very insightful. I think the same thing Azuri agrees with me as well. But so let's keep our comments coming. Any, you know, uh, suggestions, comments, or experiences that you want to share with us before we draw the curtain for the session? So, Mr. Okay, I think Ampofo has his hand up. Yes, please, you can kindly unmute yourself and then ask your question. Okay, so good morning. Mm -hmm. so good morning. Can good you hear morning, me? Yes, yeah, you can. okay. Uh, I want to commend uh, the speaker for his presentation, quite insightful. And I like the examples he cited, his life examples to support whatever point that he's making. But I, I want to, I'm just curious, you know, I, when he was presenting, he made mention of uh, issue about spousal ab abuse. So I just want to ask uh, if, uh, let's say you are working in an organization and then you are privy to information that maybe a colleague is facing spousal abuse. Uh, first of all, as a, a friend, what can you do? And then as management, what can also be done? Because we know that if uh, an employee is going through that, that kind of situation, it impacts on productivity. Mm -hmm. So, but you know, issues about marriage and relationships are personal, <laughs> you know? So it becomes a dicey issue to, uh, it's not that straightforward. So I'm just asking, if you happen to be like a friend to that particular person who is undergoing spousal abuse, what can you do? Mm. And then as management also, what are the support measures for, for a person like that? Great, thank you so much, Gracious, for the, the compliment. And I think your question is, is a very loaded question. It's a very intelligent question, you know. And, and again, let me, let, me, let me answer, or let me attempt to answer, because I know some may have, you know, more wonderful answers out there or experiences that explain it. These things are very dicey. In fact, for me, that issue, I, 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 I let, let, me, let me state something. Um, I have a policy in my organization where if there is any of such issues, we try and some of these things, I may not have the capacity for it. And I, and I always, or the HRT may not have the capacity for such things. I remember one instance, we had to engage um, a, a rehabilitation center, or we had to engage a, a trained counselor, psychologist, to come and counsel the person because it was really impacting, okay? So it is, it is easy to say that, oh, HR will call the person in and try and talk to the person. What capacity do I have? Let me tell you um, one instance. We had an instance where one of our, you know, one, one, I used to work in a place when a driver got involved in an accident, you know, and the person died, you know, the, the, the one knocked the person off, one pedestrian or the person died. And anytime the driver is there, he'll be seeing, you know, hallucinations and screaming and shouting. The person came to my office, I told the person that, I know what you're going through, but let me recommend a psychologist. We led them, we led them to, you know, um, a trained psychologist. One of them also even, I think he eventually had to go to a hospital to see the psychologist for them to bring the charges for each how to make a case. So with things like this, in the event that management doesn't have the full for support, and the truth is, the truth, the, the real practical truth is that a lot of companies may not have time because my brother, People are looking for money, okay? They say that, we, you know, the, the, the business is looking for money. So they may not have that kind of commitment, but HR may want to go out of the way and then get, try and speak to management, that, oh, let's get a psychologist, or maybe let's try and do something. So these are some of the supports. And I, for one, I, you know, I have colleagues who are psychologists and, you know, even some of my staffs are psychologists. So sometimes I'm able to bounce off some of these things invariably with them and they are able to assist and then give so i really agree the spousal abuse there is in fact it's something that needs even the counselors themselves admit that it is something that you know you know but as hr yours is to make sure that what is happening in the home does not trickle into the workplace so gracious thank you so much for this wonderful question i really appreciate it 
Yes, thank you so much, Mr. Sam. So I want to just a follow up question on what you just touched on. So with regards to creating a safe place for people to voice out these things they are going through, whether it's something at home or in the workspace, what can an organization do to create that safe space where they won't feel like whatever they said is going to be spilled out to the whole, you know, other colleagues to hear about these issues? Okay, let me give you a practical example. So uh, we, we started uh, an employee assistance program called the Counselor Counseling you know, Project. And based on that, we were, the whole program was to try and get people talking, to try and move into or empathize with our staffs so that they will, be, they will feel a part of the organization. And one of the things we had ground rules, so we did it on a pilot basis and we had ground rules. So under this, we're going to have a counselor who may be a senior member or a respected member of the organization. And we had a counselee, the one who is being, you know, counseled. And we had ground rules, okay? So we had external persons coming to train us. And one of the ground rules was what? Confidentiality. And we're made to sign that confidentiality clause that people may tell you personal things. You need to stick to it, okay? So as a matter of policy, you can, you can, you can, you can, you can craft something that, no, this is, this is a matter of policy. So let's make sure that all these things are confidential. And, and, and as an HR person, let, let them know in the event that there's a program like this, let the counselors know that in the event that somebody's situation goes out, there may be some disciplinary consequences, like something to deter people. So practically, that's what we did. We did that on a pilot basis and it really worked. So we realized that when they did the, the counseling session, we never had anybody or anybody's issue. All the issues were between the counselor and the counselee. So that's the little practical example from experience that I can, I can tell you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much. So in your field of experience, can you tell us how, you know, the, some of the obstacles, now that this is a very popular topic and we are delving into it, what are some of the, some, some of the obstacles that an organization would go through if they start implementing these things so that they will be well prepared and know how to go about it? Okay. In terms I, of, yeah. In terms of? Yeah, I want to say if it was clear. The question right. was clear. So you are talking about uh, practically the, the, in the event that maybe after this, you know, some may want to implement, you know, yes. the policy, yes. some of the obstacles. Yes. Yes. No, so the, so the, 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 the first one, the first one may be, you know, resistance from even top management in the first place, because that's where the whole thing starts from. So if you don't get a top management that buys into this, your, your initiative has been killed from the beginning. Now, let's assume that top management has even bought into it. Now, coming down to the various managers coming down to even the staffs themselves, okay? Because sometimes the staffs may be like, I remember there was an instance where we felt that, oh, a certain category of staffs were being sidelined. You know, they were doing certain program for this category, like it was for everybody, but they felt they were not. So we decided, oh, let's take it to their hub. And you will be amazed that when we took it, they said they don't want. They said they don't like it, so they boycotted it. You understand me? So they, the staffs themselves may even be an obstacle. That's why, again, Let's go back to what we said, that you need to measure and assess. You need to get the data, find out really what it is that is on the ground. Then I believe you'll be able to, you know, you know get a very solid strategy, uh, strategy that is based on evidence. Thank you. Thank you so much for that response. I think I see patients quick here. Uh, Alice, uh, please, you can go ahead and ask your question. Hey, so Mr. Sam, do you have any, you know, last thoughts or things that you would do to, I mean, you can say to, you know, just wrap up the session? All right. All right. I think that uh, thank you very much for, uh, you know, your audience listening. Uh, 